Hello and welcome to another edition of the Full Force News Burst, brought to you by GeneralsJoes.com. With me as your host, Chris Administration 80 McLeod, aka Diagnostic 80, joining me today to discuss Toys R Us UK's depressing news is Eric Toys R F*** Aranya, Adam Jeffrey's Funeral Riches, <laughs> Paddy I Was So Poor I Wasn't Allowed In A Toys R Us, Lennon, and Dave, now more successful than Toys R Us Tree. <laughs> oh! <laughs> that burns, especially after you putting up the meme at the last episode. I mean, that was really good for business. <laughs> <laughs> Damn! So, without further ado, let's get stuck into this news burst. Sad news has emerged today out of Toys R Us UK with the company failing to get a buyer for their massive VAT debt at the last minute and now they are officially going into administration. A very sad state of affairs indeed and one that we will now discuss on today's News Blast. So first off, let's discuss the UK store closures and the administration itself. Dave, you're obviously on the ground there. Obviously there was that um, Matt Booker posted a a, a video from inside of Toys R Us like today. So tell us what it's been like in the UK. Oh, it's been awful, Chris. Like cats, <laughs> dogs, like like mass panic. Um, people have been like going in and breaking cats windows. Cats and dogs to, like, getting married. <laughs> yeah. it's, it, 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 it is like a, a full on disaster zone here. It's like you're uh, reporting I'm, from the scene. It's brilliant. I am. I am actually reporting from the scene. It's uh, it's been a little bit it's cold. Been, and a little bit it's been. It's been. And as we speak, there is a, a, a mob looking at uh, a, a rank of trolleys and they're wondering whether or not to take a wrench to them so they could get a, a pound coin out of one of the handles there. Um, these are desperate times, Chris. Desperate. So in the, in the background of that segment, can we just put in, like, helicopter noises, yes. sirens, yes. fire? There will be a riot sound bite going on in the background. Um, but in all seriousness, Dave, like, what's the kind of talk been of the actual closure and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Really, as sad as it's, it is, you've already had like the first leg of closures going through. Uh, and the, the, the video that Matt Booker posted up, which um, if it's like linked off the show notes, is a store that's already in that process of being closed down. So it wasn't like this is what's happened like literally immediately. That was something that was determined a few weeks back. And as a result of that, I think the writing was on the wall that people felt that there's not much that's going to be happening here because it's yo-yoed so much in like literally the last sort of six months or so that when you know yourselves with there's not really been anything massive to come along uh you know they're not no real kind of christmas must-haves in terms of like Mm. the toys you know that the last one that you had was fidget spinners that was like back in may Christ. before then it was um hatchimals and i don't know if, if that was the same in the states but hatchimals was like the the, the christmas must have toy for yeah. um 2016 but you didn't really have one this time around and then where you had like christmas releases of you know uh, last jedi everybody talks about that they immediately think of like hasbro toy sales but like it, it's lego as well and it's it's affected lego's toy sales so you've not really had anything driving people into store you know because you know, for, for whatever demand and it's too little too late really anything yeah. that was being implemented it was it, the writing was on the wall six months ago really it, it was just a case of when and i and if i'm honest i'm surprised that they've managed to last this long i thought in this moment you get into january that was it but yeah. uh, they've managed to kind of like limp along for a few more weeks. And that was because they'd already made that decision to close a bunch of stores already. Yeah. Paddy, you sent me an article earlier on today kind of suggesting like a few other issues going on uh, kind of behind the scenes. Was there anything like, I mean, there was something to do with like the board being a, a kind of like culpable for some some issues, right? Yeah. So the, the, the administration process in the UK is when you can't sell the entire business in one block. What you do is you appoint someone to se- sell off parts of it um, and close the rest. So what they're going to try to do now is sell bits and pieces of the business. So, you know, well-performing stores might be sold to people like the Entertainer or Smiths and the other part of it will be closed down. Uh, so it's, it's it's essentially a winding down of the of, of the company, and um, so it's it's fairly final in, in terms of what's going to happen now. Like it's they are done essentially, 
I mean, and I think that's the brand name is probably going to disappear from the British landscape, if if you get me. Yeah. The issue the issue they have is that they are going to be leaving owing the British government about fifteen million dollars uh, or fifteen million sterling in unpaid taxes that they're not going to be able to pay back. That's actually illegal. Um, the directors of a company can get done for what's called overtrading, where you trade irregardless of the fact that the yeah, business is yeah. no longer a, a going concern. You know, you're racking up debt rather than yeah. trying to trade out. And the directors of the business can be held you know, liable for that. Yeah. And there's been a few people saying that possibly keeping it running as long as they did, although it was probably the, the right thing to do for the staff, Mm. Um, all they've really done is run up more debt that they're never going to be paid back. And the directors and senior management can be can get in quite a lot of trouble for doing that. Mm. Are we talking jail time? Uh, serious fines and possibly, I don't know what the penalties are in the UK, but in Ireland, the, that crime would come with a um, uh, serious fines and being uh, banned from working in a business for several years. Jeez. In America, they lock them in giraffe cages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in the UK, rich people actually are, are required to abide by the law. That's, that's <laughs> totally um, unheard of here in the U.S. The one, the one thing, the one thing you cannot do is f- over the tax man in England and Ireland. I'm the tax man. And if you if you f- over the tax man, he will come after you, and they will put you in prison. And um, that is that is the one thing you you, you should not do in business here in, in, the, the, right. side, in the side of the Atlantic. Imagine a tax version of Jason Bourne. <laughs> That's what they, they'll send him well, after they, you. Well, they have a tendency to prosecute and they have a tendency to win because judges and the courts don't like people not paying their taxes either. Yeah. Now, OK, so... The US has already closed a number of stores, and that's kind of increased a little bit recently. And I, I mean, I, I can I can just see that happening over and over and over again until there's nothing left. But what is it like in in the US, um, Adam and Eric? We'll start with um, we'll start with Adam on this one. What's the feeling like? Do you, do you, I mean, is it is it? Do you think it's just going to do the same thing as it's happened in the UK, and they're just going to ha- have to like go into administration and, and jack it in? Unfortunately, I do think it's probably headed in that direction. I mean, uh, we'll we'll get into this with my copious notes I've taken, but it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just it's a sinking ship and it, and it has been for a long time and it's incredibly sad, but I, I don't really see anything drastic enough happening to turn that around to actually salvage the company in time. I mean, it started as 182 closures. Now they're already talking about another 200. I mean, they've literally over the course of six months cut their entire fleet of stores in half. Like you can't keep going at that pace. They only have about 800 stores to begin with in the U S and they're closing down 200. You're, you know, you're that's, that's you know, significant. Yeah. Point it's a huge amount yeah i mean it, in it, in terms of like the way it's kind of gone in the uk i i, I know the companies are technically it's it's brand co-branded obviously but and i know they went they kind of it went separate didn't it at, at some point in like i think like the late 80s possibly and i'm sure a german company took over the like the uk side of things anyway back when like back then um, I really don't know the ins and outs of who owns what and where it is. I mean, these 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 whole business situations seem to be so convoluted, so complex, so all over the place. It's not just the case of Toys R Us failing and it just shuts down everywhere, is it? It's it's like a it's like all these different like factions and and different elements of it having to be shut down. So, do you think there would? I mean, is there any chance of salvage in the United States to keep at least a small amount of stores? And then kind of, you know, get back to, you know, building up again? Or do you think it has really gone beyond that and we're looking at a different way of buying anyway? I think it's toast. I, I'm i shocked it lasted as long as it has. <laughs> He's toast. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, uh, I used to work for Toys R Us. I was a manager of one of the stores, both Savannah and in uh, Florida. Yeah, so it's your fault is what you're saying. So it's my fault. And um, <laughs> the company, just like KB before it, yeah. It, yeah. They just they kept making the same mistakes over yeah. and over again. And they would they wouldn't they the next year they would come in and ever they would have all these new decisions and these remodels and this and that. Yeah. And this, oh, it's all about mom now this year, or it's all about this, or we're gonna do this this year, and it's all gonna be about Imaginarium, it's all gonna be about Babies R Us. And every year there was something new yeah. that they 
they were doing, but really they were just doing the same things. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they were doing the same. They would care that what they would say it's all about, or they would tell us to say it's all about, or whatever, wasn't really any different because they wouldn't carry different stock and they wouldn't hire more people. They mm. wouldn't hire people who knew the product. They oh, wouldn't. That's, that's the worst, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So it just kind of became this like over and over and over again doing the same thing. Well, of course you're not going to do well that way like that's not how you make decisions that's not how you say you don't save a sinking ship by pouring more water on it pouring more water on like (laughs) oh you know what'll help this yeah and you know like it's just kind of this mess um i don't think the u.s has any chance of saving it my guess is after christmas the remaining toys r us's will announce that they're closing down as well Mm. i'd be surprised if it's that long really and one of those things you you mentioned like constantly making the same mistakes i feel like it was more like they just made one long error of not doing something about the 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 the, the situation they were in and it's not necessarily that they were like i don't know hemorrhaging like left right and center and again we don't i don't really know the the ins and outs of of what they were making over the years and stuff but when i worked there I, there were so many things I wanted to change about the place. And, it, you know, I was only there for like a year. So it wasn't like, you know, I was going to do anything in that time anyway. But it just it always seemed to me like the, you're right. The people that, that that they hire, and they're not like they don't know anything about the product. They're just like, I mean, they're just doing it for a job, a minimum wage crap job. So therefore, you that's what you're getting. You're not if you're not putting it if you're not putting in to get like really decent kind of high level staff then that has an issue that has an effect um a very minor one but over a long period of time it can you know be an issue but i thought there were just so many different things about the place that could have been done i mean we mentioned we've mentioned it multiple times because we've talked about this ever since it's kicked off the toys r us going you know getting into trouble um since last year so um, pretty much every episode we've ever done we've talked about it so since then and and those things like you know dave mentioned just putting a cafe in you know simple thing like that yeah of course i mean why has that not been done it just seemed like a no-brainer limiting like that it always seems like there's loads of space in there and not enough to fill it uh you know even in like some of the smaller toys r us stores and you think and then the, but then you notice there are like three or four in each town and you think geez that's a lot you know is it really necessary to have that many and you know and i think if if they had they, they seem to expand far more than their reach over over a period you know when they were at their peak that's kind of the american way i mean to- toys r us in the the uh, late 90s early mid 90s maybe uh play world went out and play world was really toys r us's big competitor way back through the 80s and stuff it was the same size store if there was a Toys R Us within a couple of models miles would usually be a play world, a Lionel play world. And um, when play world went out of business and closed down all their shops and got rid of all their stock and everything like that, Toys R Us just, they were just like, well, we have no more competitors because they didn't consider KB a competitor. Yeah. And they just like started wringing their hands and expanding yeah. all over the place. And they probably shouldn't have like the, the market wasn't there to support two huge big box toy store chains why do you think it suddenly is now yeah 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 it's uh that's a shame i mean the whole thing's really depressing do you, i mean like, we've talked globally and we've talked a little bit about what they i mean we haven't really discussed it so what could they have done differently or other than obviously the kind of the rate of expansion obviously could have been minimized but i mean are there any other things that could have been done to prevent this from happening i mean i mean well the, the main competitors i suppose go like a lot as we go along weren't other stores because they were just destroying them and putting them out of business anyway it was it was probably more so internet right so like amazon and 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 that kind of stuff as that improved i felt that toys r us didn't would you agree with that definitely i mean their their online offering has been pretty bad they were late to the party doing it and when they did do it they didn't do it very well so they, they didn't they didn't become the place you went to to buy stuff online in, in terms of toys, which is something they could have really gotten into if they'd taken the lead and got in there earlier with with a decent um, decent setup, they would be the the destination online for that. But I mean that they're not, you know, and they and they never really seem to committed to the online trading at all. Yeah, that was that was a big miss, I think, on on their part. W- what other things could they do though? I mean, what what was what was there to be changed? I'll go ahead and jump uh, in here. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> get get ready for your long rant. <laughs> So uh, the first thing I would say is more 
what they shouldn't have changed. So I'll preface this by saying I'm an absolute Toys R Us fanatic. I own store displays, signs, shopping baskets, uniforms. I bought literally thousands of action figures there over the course of my life. So I'm going to say all this with love. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, Toys R Us. I yeah. hate you, man. Sorry. I'm not Toys R Us's accountant. And, and it is hard with a company this big with such a constantly changing retail landscape to point to any one thing and, and say it's the culprit for their declining sales. But I do believe the devil is in the details. And on the small side, they have been failing for a long time. Mm-hmm. And most of it's pretty obvious stuff. Um, there's a couple of things I think are really worth mentioning here, though. And I'll start with the biggest one, which is the store's presentation, uh, both the exterior facade and the, the internal floor plan. Images. Uh, images. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so what you're looking at right here is a picture of a typical <laughs> Toys R Us built in the 1980s. Um, it's bold. It's visually striking. It demands attention. And if you were a parent then, this was your worst nightmare because a kid could spot this building from a mile away. I mean, just look at this. It's fun. It's exciting, right? Yeah. But now compare that to the recent remodels that have been occurring in the last couple of years. Uh, th- this photo I actually took myself. This is the store located in Brandon, Florida, and it was remodeled to look like this just a few months ago. Was it remodeled to look like the flushomatic kind of, um, yeah. <laughs> like the flushies and the grocery gang and the poops? It is so <laughs> bland. I- I've seen dentist's office that are more exciting looking. <laughs> They've gone for this ultra Hang on, modern. Let me, let me flash a dentist office up as well at the same time. <laughs> Go. It, it's, it's this like ultra modern sterile white look and I, i'm just yeah. like who thought this was a good idea other than literally having the word toys on the building what about this visual in any way implies that there is fun to be had inside this building yeah and then more images <laughs> speaking of the inside most of the stores have eliminated having aisles that literally had toys piled to the ceiling in favor of this new open concept floor plan where the store is kind of like divided into quadrants with aisles that are only a little over waist high yeah and I'm sure there was some line of thinking behind that decision that said, well, the more of the store you can see, the more you'll want to buy or something. But to me, I like the feeling of full immersion where it's almost like sensory overload of whatever yeah. aisle down. It was the one thing mm-hmm. that really made Toys R Us stick out yeah. as being above all the other retailers. Mountains and mountains of, of, of f-ing, yeah, like like skyscrapers of toys all around you. Absolutely. Yeah, well, actually, Chris, one of the one of the images I sent you was the, Toys R- the Gundam aisle in the Toys R Us in Kyoto when I was there last year. And it's twice the height of a person yeah yeah you know and you don't see them like that over here anymore although let's just let's just get that straight twice the height of a regular human person right so like yes not an irish person (laughs) sorry we're not all four feet high i can't i can't Um, not do irish jokes when you're on paddy it's just not fair you know it's not fair so anyway yes flash the i'll flash the gundam up just to uh to show as well because that's a very good point i mean I understand why a business that's, you know, literally tens of millions of dollars in debt doesn't want to overorder product. They can't move. So, I mean, it, it, you know, I understand they're running a tighter ship financially and there's a reason why they have less product. But like, yeah. it's lost a lot of the magic doing that. And and also there was a, a, a huge bonus to that abundance of product. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when I was a kid, I probably started collecting G.I. Joe specifically around like 89, 90 and there were so many things from 87, 88, 89 that I was able to get retroactively because yeah. Toys R Us had such a depth of product. And now you're mm-hmm. lucky if you can find stuff from one wave back because they just they don't carry that that abundance anymore. I, I suppose that, that depends on what kind of store you're in because, I mean, there's, there's, I've been in a couple of stores where it's only the previous wave and you're not getting anything new. So it's like it's that mm. awkward thing where you've got the one wave of things that you've already got and you're seeing it all the time. And then you, you'll never, you, the new stuff goes because, you know, someone turns up at six o'clock in the morning and buys it or something. I don't know. But yeah, it's, um, I, 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 mean, I get well, what you're saying. Though. You're fault. right. It's it's very, it's not, there's no depth there. There's no like, you know, there's not a magnitude of items to choose from. To add to what uh, Adam is saying, the um, I was there when, I, w- I was actually present at two different Toys R Us's when they uh, remodeled from the aisles uh, stacked to the ceiling to the uh, racetrack with the quadrants yeah and the uh the the thought that was explained to us at the time was literally that parents specifically grandparents would come in and kind of wander the store because of the layout because like the they thought the aisles were too streamlined and getting people in and out too quickly (laughs) so it was like it was like this weird when i was at toys r us um there were a couple of really awful things that happened 
to me and like during my time there and one of the really awkward times when i was there was when they started they they literally told us to um push the the buyer protection plan oh yeah 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 when that was when that was instituted and they um they literally one of the managers literally told me that i had to push it especially on grandparents because they didn't know better jeez did not buy it and i refuse i never once pushed it i never once sold one i used to get written up all the time for it and i used to get in a lot of trouble for it because they would they would i would i told them that i'm not conning old people out of their money it's not gonna happen it's selling air um, the other thing that they, when they did remodel to that racetrack, they they were looking at Walmart's design with the racetrack and stuff. How yeah. and Targets kind of have that because Walmart's and Targets are places where people do go and kind of meander and shop because there's multiple, there's clothing and groceries and toys and electronics and all this stuff in one place. Yeah, Toys for us is just toys. It's a destination place. You come in. I'm a collector. I'm not going to go in and accidentally go buy some diapers and a doll dress like it's not i might i might (laughs) you might but like that was actually like their plan from the like early 2000s suddenly became one of deception and confusion and that was their plan and it was really uncomfortable and strange to work there during that time because these things were like happening and you'd have these managers who were like i was fresh out of high uh fresh out of college and like i had a degree and i'm looking for a real job and i'm working at toys r us to pay bills and then i have these schmucks telling me to con people out of money and i'm and like my managers didn't have a degree and were younger than me and were and i'm like god this is like the worst yeah (laughs) No, I, I, I was in, well, I worked there as well, and I, I kind of refused to be the pushy salesman kind of thing there, and I was one of the, you know, but I enjoyed, I, I kind of enjoyed it and liked being there, so it was kind of, you know, p- ultra polite and happy to see people and talk to them about stuff, so it was it was a different way of thinking, and I think it worked a hell of a lot better than going up to people and being like, oh, do you need this, 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 you need to get this, you need to get this, and it's like really kind of pushing it on people, it's like, don't, just, you know, make sure they know you're there if they need any help, and then f- leave them alone like that the, to me that's like uh, when i go shopping i don't want to be like constantly harassed and it f- happens all the time like someone i we went in one store and i had about three i had three times this guy came up and asked us if we needed any help and i was like dude i've just told you like the first two times i will f- come he, to he you probably told, uh, he probably he probably told you were shoplifting chris <laughs> Chris, do you need help? No, he he listens to the show. He's thinking, my God, Chris is here. This could make my month's target. In fact, this could even well, be my year's sorted. target. Commission. The, the, the commission dollar signs popped up in his eyes. I also think, Chris, that's also a cultural thing where if you're shopping in America, they actually come up and ask you if you want help. Yeah, which I don't have a problem with. You're, you're probably used to the UK and Ireland method of shopping where they just scream at you and then, <laughs> Tell you and then you run away. <laughs> Just get out. Why are you still here after 10 minutes? Get out. <laughs> that is true, actually. It's probably why they're going into administration. It was always the weirdest thing whenever, whenever I was in the States buying clothes or whatever. And people like all the store staff coming up to you and asking you, do you need any help? Do you need any sizes? What do you need? Can we help you? And you're like, no, just let me browse for <laughs> sake. <laughs> let me f***ing steal stuff without you looking at me all the time. <laughs> Jesus. God. But yeah, no, I um, I do, I don't mind being asked initially. It's just when you've said I'm good, I'll you know I'll come and get. In. And, and as long as they say like you know I'll you know if if you need anything, just ask. Totally cool with that. But it's when you get people like they they come and like arrow at you, and then they do it again and again and again. It's like, dude, I know I've been in here for three hours, but f- off. <laughs> um, Clearly, you've never been into a games workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Oh my god, I those don't... guys are trained Rottweilers. <laughs> to they jump might, on that, you. They might have been the Rottweilers they released, Dave, in that Games Workshop. <laughs> Release, Release the, the hounds. hounds. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to have us both saying that and Mr. Burns at the same time. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, um, Adam, was there any other stuff you wanted to um, discuss? Because I know you've got like a sh- ton to uh to get stuck into yeah well um (laughs) talking about areas that they've gone wrong um 
I mean, this is just a very minor gripe, but I think it's something worth mentioning. One of the things that always was a big, big deal to me as a kid was their Christmas holiday catalog, mm. I think for a lot of people. And I mean, I have very distinct memories of, of certain ones, like the 1993 catalog. They had a Toys R Us exclusive uh, Toy Biz X-Men set called the Mutant Hall of Fame, which was awesome. the first ever Professor X figure. Nice. And oh, right. And that catalog was, you know, it was very impactful as a kid because you'd be looking through it and it was all the, the newest, latest, greatest stuff and you wanted it and you were circling it and whatever. And so <laughs> this year I was, I was in Toys R Us, I got their 2017 catalog and I was thumbing through it and really nothing that exciting. But something really stood out to me was I looked at the WWE figure section and there was only six figures shown. And of the six, three of them included adam rose who left the company in 2016 justin <laughs> gabriel who left in 2015 and christian who left in 2014 wow. and i'm thinking you know it's not a classics line is it <laughs> yeah you know obviously print advertising is mostly dead so i don't want to make a bigger deal out of this than it is but really in the grand scheme of things it's like if you're even going to bother to produce a catalog wouldn't you want it to only feature the latest and greatest products isn't that kind of the whole point of advertising yeah. and, and these are the little things it's like I don't watch a lot of kids programming, but like, do they have commercials anymore? I mean, like, uh, what are they doing to draw see, people in? That that leads me into something else. Like, I remember again around Christmas time, and even like during the year, uh, uh, that you'd have Toys R Us adverts. Now, I must admit, like, um, there's a there's a big cultural difference here. That the US had a much different theme tune and an advertising campaign, and and so it's really where like so for the UK guys, we've got this own our own special one, which I will play the sound here now. Um, and you guys had a completely different one, and I noticed that culturally, it's always really weird to have like the UK people really don't necessarily get on with the US um, advertising, and vice versa. Kate's always going on about how the Toys R Us theme in the US is much better than the UK one, and like having a go at me for it. But I didn't write it, honey. No, I'm kidding. But um, like at the same time, like th th there's something so important about the advertising for kids like you know it's they hear that and it's like a, a dog when he hears the word treat or something they just go nuts and i was i just enamored by the toys r us commercials back in the day and again around christmas they'd always have this same lead into it wouldn't they guys where it would be the car coming over the hill like an animated car driving through like you're the point of view of the driver with the lights on and you're going through this mm. like country road it's really random and, and then, then it's like all, never all... mind the Box, drop it, toys are us. That's what it should have been. It was like a, a <laughs> version of holidays are coming, holidays are coming, yeah. holidays are coming. Come I mean, toys I, us, toys I mean, I've played it a trillion times actually on the show. <laughs> it's like the Rolf Harris version. <laughs> <laughs> But, you can join today. <laughs> that, they're all going to be on there. But um, the so yeah, and you'd get this like the car would come up to the the, the lot, and you and the lights would light up the Toys R Us outside, and you get the theme tune, and then you'd be inside Toys R Us where it's at night, and there and Jeffrey and these kids are stocking the shelves, and you think F hell, child labour laws for one, and no, I'm kidding, um, and also you know giraffes, but that's that's irrelevant. But it was so like, and they would always have like the same kind of advert, but then they would intersect with whatever new thing was out and there was a bunch of action force ones weren't there mm. do you remember those when they'd have like oh and you can get the thunder machine and the uh, killer whale and all that kind of shit. and they would say it like as it was yeah you know, they'd, showing they'd like, always always do like a little spot to promote so either certain deals or have certain agreements with the toy brands themselves uh to support their marketing in return for you know discounted stock mm. or they would receive a little bit of the marketing fund towards uh the commercials because Again, to kind of put it into perspective for non-UK listeners, um, we've only got two, uh, well, uh, during the period of time that Chris is talking about, we've only got two TV channels that does TV commercials. ITV and Channel 4. So they literally had the monopoly and could charge whatever they want because we only had for like four TV channels. It meant the actual chances of your advert being seen had a greater rate of success than other media elsewhere around the world you know you, you you were pretty much guaranteed x amount of hundreds of thousands or depending on where you put that advert slot millions literally millions of people and like you don't get that kind of coverage today no. like, not even close it's so spread on on like cable channels and sky channel channels yeah, yeah so these things were like ridiculously expensive because like the 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 network knew that they they had them 
by the the short and curly. The they can charge balls. whatever. They want. Yeah. So so <laughs> what what happened is that uh, a lot of uh, toy advertising became like a cooperative. So that they uh, the the brands themselves would like help finance, put money towards, so that X amount of commercials could be aired at certain times or within certain premium spots over a period of time, and and that's where you would have like. My Little Pony being featured yeah, yeah. and a Lego set. Sylvanian and Families. Barbie. And yeah, Sylvanian Families. All, all are like those kind of brands from like uh, late 80s into like early 90s that they would all sort of like chip towards like this overall like marketing fund. But uh, oh, it was ace. And, and also there's probably some something else to kind of go along with that. The um, From back in the day to now um, and something that Adam's reminded me of, like the way that Jeffrey's evolved as a character for this for this brand uh, do, do you want to kind of go through that, Adam? Do you want to talk about the way he's evolved over the years? Yeah, so some of this is just my personal aesthetic preference, obviously, and, and people are seeing this visual right now while I say this. So when Toys R Us, I don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if it was when Toys R Us debuted, but when Jeffrey debuted in 1965, I mean, obviously there was definitely some refinement that still needed to occur there. But <laughs> by about 1975 through 2000, I think that that's pretty much the Jeffrey that we all know and love, you yeah, know, give yeah. or take some details. Agreed. It's, it's cute. It's funny. It's, it's you know, inviting, whatever. But then they take this very weird detour in 2001 <laughs> where it becomes a, a, a real giraffe, like an, an actual, like, you know, live giraffe, voiced by Tom Hanks, which also... I'm sure for kids who so closely identify his voice as being Woody from Toy Story, that's kind of a, a weird disconnect, too. Yeah. And then in 2007, he, he gets <laughs> even worse to make up. Can I, can I just say, he looks a little bit simple. He actually looks very much <laughs> like there was a character in the Bash Street Kids um, back in the UK. Do you, remember, do you remember that, Dave? Paddy? Plug. Plug, thank you. He looks like yeah, Plug. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm going to flash plug up as well, just as a as a side by side comparison, because that <laughs> that is going <laughs> to that is going to be amazing. Oh my I, god! I think a, a correlation here that the the 2007 design, which they're still currently using, kind of looks like something you'd see on babies' clothes, like on like a yeah. like a ones from Carter's or something. And the thing that's funny to me about that is you notice in the U.S. at least out of the first uh, batch of the 182 stores they closed the vast majority of them were Babies Are Us. And so clearly that was the area that they felt was the least valuable aspect of the brand. And I'm yeah. like, it, it seems like they're marketing younger than they should be. And, and clearly that's the part that they view as being the most failing. So it's a strange, I, if I was them, much like the, the building facades, I'd almost be inclined to revert back to the 80s or 90s logo and kind of try to recapture some of that lost magic because... I mean, you can literally see the, the, the visual decline happening right before your eyes, and, and it's reflected in sales. I'm going to try and morph them all together. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, <laughs> what's interesting about them closing all the Babies R Us's first is when I was there, Babies R Us was the most profitable thing for them, yeah. and it was the most important thing for the company all the time. I suppose there were necessities there that they were selling as well, weren't there? There were things that people like needed. Mm -hmm. As opposed to toys, yeah, which is like... And that's you know, what was always said, is they, they said, you know, well, Walmart can't... They, they can sell other things cheaper than Toys R Us. Because they can go to the companies and go, we want a TV that's... We want it to cost this much. And, they're, and the company that makes a TV goes, well, we don't make it that costs this much, it costs this much. And they're like, well, make us one that costs this much. <laughs> but they can't do that with baby seats and trolleys and stuff like that. Because if they go to them, they go, well legally we can't make one like that because it's unsafe yeah yeah so that's what was happening at the time and i don't know if that's changed or and and america the you know the american people would the one place that they will spend oh yeah, more yeah. money is when is that new parent will go out and spend the extra money versus but you know saving twenty dollars at walmart they will go somewhere else to babies are us and they will spend extra money. Now, that's obviously turned around because the babies are us are what's closing around mm. in the US. And that's really that surprises me. Although the babies are us that's closing near me is out far away from everything. I know that obviously the, the lack of convenience for us, say, you know, parents, first time parents yeah. and that kind of stuff, that's not gonna help, is it? Yeah. No, so the babies are us that is staying open is right next to a target. So like maybe like that maybe they Location. when they expanded yeah. and they started opening all these babies or us's which they did do and through the late two thousands early two thousand like the two thousand five onward they did start opening babies or us's all over the place yeah 
and it's possible well, that they is, um... overextended themselves and they've you know realized that so that's why they're closing them first i don't really know though because i'm su- i was surprised by the babies R Us's mm. being the first things that got hit just on a, in particular races in uk a lot of kind of people who are commenting on uh, on the story today about the administration you know retail experts and so on are saying that it's the out of town stores the big warehouse operations that are killing them. I mean, they must they must cost a fortune. The administrators seem to think that the ones that are smaller, nearer to town centres, are the ones that can be saved or would be purchased by someone like Smiths or the Entertainer, because because they are still, you know, got decent footfall. The rents are smaller and they make money, but it's those big out of town locations where they were just essentially in a retail park, uh, you know, outside on the motorway. Those things. They cost them a lot of money. They're so big that they can't fill them with stock. Yeah. And so they're paying they're paying huge rents when they're not using half the square footage they're renting. So that is and those big stores are just hemorrhaging money. And that's what's driven them to into administration here in the UK. <sighs> okay. Well, I think we've probably discussed Toys R Us like the closure and everything in you know in general uh, to its um, well to to its death pretty much. We at least we don't have to talk about it anymore, right? <laughs> uh, well, uh, can, can we talk about a couple of positives? Since yes, we've, since let, we've roasted them so let's hard. Finish on a positive before we move on to uh, our favorite exclusives. Yes, let's do that, Adam. Go for it, mate. Okay, so there has been a few things. I mean, I I know that I've kind of uh, gone a little Tupac hit him up on him you with this, but all, you all yeah. over them, mate. <laughs> but it it really hasn't been all bad. Um. In the last few years, they've implemented a rewards program. Yeah, and I think cool. that's really great. Um, if if can't you're a frequent shopper, well, you can't. <laughs> in in four hundred stores, you still can't <laughs> um, until they can it. But um, but you know, four hundred three ninety nine, three ninety eight, three ninety seven, three ninety six. I I don't know. Um, I, I don't actually know how much you have to spend to get to get the five dollar certificates they reward you. It just kind of randomly happens, but like it's always a nice little bonus considering you never yeah. got anything before. So I like that. Um, they've tried in the last couple of years to do some augmented reality stuff. So the the holiday catalog in 2016 had a cool thing where you'd scan it with your phone and a, a 3D Jeffrey would kind of pop out of some of the pages and interact with the the catalog. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, Plug would come out of the pages of the catalog. Yeah, and they also did a um a <laughs> Bad acid. An app in 2017, the Play Chaser app. Yes. Which, again, now that's... I appreciate that they're at least trying something new. The problem with that is I don't know how many kids this really will have an effect on because how many kids that are in that age range, five, six years old, are walking around with an iPhone? I it, I don't know. But well, I can tell, I can, All of them. I can tell you now that when I went... the Every time I've been in that Toys R Us, when, after the implemented Play Chaser, one, I couldn't use it on my phone because it's still locked to the UK annoyingly, but that that's irrelevant. But um, when... So, like... When I was going around and looking around, there were tons of kids in there, tons of people around. I was like, wow, this is... And it was because I think that we just got the news that it was closed or, you know, it was shutting down. So I think people were just trying to, you know, clear the place out. Um, And there were loads of people around. Nobody was using the Play Chaser app. And Mm. they'd already had damage on about three of the Play Chaser points that are, like, positioned around the place. And I was thinking, f*** hell, it's only been up for about two weeks. And it's all... And, like, it's not even... It's not even that much of a... You know, it's not like a sh- or anything around there, but it was just, I was like, wow. So already, like, the actual physical stuff there is, is and doesn't work, and kids aren't using it. So it really was too little too late, and I think uh, I would say about five years out of date already. I think the augmented reality thing is one of those things that... Until it's until it's really smooth and you don't even have to think about it, I I just don't think it's going to be one of the. I don't think it's going to be a successful endeavor. I mean, we've, we're still struggling with, I mean, VR and um, a ton of other different technological advances that haven't quite taken the game industry by storm yet. So if if it hasn't happened there just yet, then it's it's you know it's struggling to kind of implement itself elsewhere. I mean, people are just comfortable with their phones now. You know, like everything everything is like. You know, they're just in there. So if they can make that a smooth transition, if they can make it like a very easy, good service, 
I can see it working, but yeah, as as of now, it's it was way too little, too late. I've been in some McDonald's recently that have done uh, some cool stuff where they'll have like the a table, table that has lights oh, on it when you amazing. run your. Amazing. And I don't see that that kind of stuff. I think would translate really well to Toys R Us if they could come for some kind of interactive physical, demo stuff. Yeah, actual. Yeah, that doesn't things. require you to do any work on your end. It's just there to play with. I think that would help draw people in. But uh, I digress. Um, but a couple other things, real quick. I thought they did that were pretty good lately. Um, there was a. Uh, San Diego Zoo, maybe, or Bronx Zoo. I can't remember, but um, it was a big national story. Uh, a few months ago, there was a, a baby giraffe being born, and Toys R Us had sponsored it. And Aww. so they had a live stream camera you could watch that had the Toys R Us logo in the corner the whole time while you watched the baby giraffe walking around That's and stuff. That's cool. And, well, you know, you watched that it was... being born. Oh, God, like, that'd be gross, yeah. wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, that... <laughs> yeah. And, and now they can't sponsor it, so it's been executed. Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> No, well, actually, this was so stupid. So the baby is born, right? And then they had some kind of vote to name it, and they named the baby Tajiri. And I'm like, who thought that was good? Like, why isn't the baby named Jeffrey? Like, duh. But, you know, again, like, whatever. And uh, lastly, I guess we all know that, that Toys R Us uh, has, a, has acquired the assets of some of their uh, their fallen competitors. So they own FAO Schwartz and KB Toys um, mm-hmm. branding now. And so... They've opened um, pop-up shops sometimes in, in malls uh, called Toys R Us Express, and I think that those are doing kind of a good job of filling the void left by the absence of KB Toys, although uh, obviously malls are in a decline, too, so that that's a whole other can of worms, but... I, that's a but, whole other episode. But, but it, does, it does tie back into what Patty was saying, though, that some of the smaller locations have been performing well, and I think that... I think that ultimately, I don't think Toys R Us is going to completely go away, because... How many times have you heard the phrase R Us used as a parody for something else? I mean, there is a lot of brand equity and value in that name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think R that us. He... Yeah, well, whatever. Well, <laughs> they, they actually sent a cease and desist to a friend of mine, Gus, who... Um... <laughs> no, 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 no. He, uh... <laughs> He's he, weirdly, he's probably one of the people behind the downfall of Toys R Us because he's one of the heads of new product development at Amazon. Um, but he is a prolific Star Wars collector that has a phenomenal collection of stuff. But way back in the early infancy of the internet, he started uh, a website called Toys R Gus. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and uh, he actually ended up getting a cease and desist uh, from Toys R Us, uh, and he actually had to change the the website called the SWCA.com, which is the Star Wars Collectors Archive, uh, which is the best place to go for any information on the pre-production and history toy making history process of the the Kenner line. Cool. Uh, but what this means is that Gus can actually like start using his old URL again. <laughs> And, and finally, <laughs> outlived, finally, there is a silver lining. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. So he, he's probably actually quite chuffed because um, it's still active. He still owns it all. Yeah, Toys R Gus, but like the SWCA.com is <laughs> is the uh, replacement for the last what, ten plus years. <laughs> In an ironic twist, I was actually going to suggest that I wouldn't be surprised at all if Amazon or or someone like or Walmart or somebody ends up buying the Toys R Us brand because yeah. there's so much value in the name to just use that as a mm. marketing for your toy uh, your toy yeah, area the toy to section say, for Amazon you know, yeah Toys R Us section yeah sponsored by Amazon or powered by Amazon or whatever to so, be honest I'm sure that, I'm sure the meetings are going on as we speak yeah, for that one no yeah, doubt. I, w- I would almost guarantee that that's happening with either Walmart or Amazon. You know that there's a. There's, it's like throwing a bit or of meat Bosch into Bite. a. F- yeah. Get Bo- Boss Fight to own it. it yeah. <laughs> T- toys are boss. That doesn't make sense. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's. I think that's enough talk on Toys R Us as uh, demise in the UK, uh, filtering through to the US. Unfortunately, obviously, it's just, it's just such a sad, depressing. But at the same time, we, we had this conversation, Eric, you mentioned this last time we were on the show. You feel sad, but at the same time, you're kind of like, you're not surprised. And it's also, no, that's what right. you get from not, you know, dealing with the issues when when you should have dealt with them. So brought it on themselves, but it's really, really sad. And there are a lot of people that this is affecting. You know, there's a lot of people are going to be out of work. Yeah, as a larger issue, it's just the the old guard corporations are all having such a hard time figuring out what to do in in this new age i mean this is just it's not just toys r us it's it's everybody like uh you know patty was saying about them coming to the game late on the the internet on the website and stuff it's not just them who did that i mean everybody was late on that i mean who how many people go to target or walmart.com to buy stuff (laughs) yeah yeah Mm -hmm. yeah you know you're gonna buy stuff online you always Mm -hmm. check 
Amazon first. Like, that's where you go. Or yeah. if you're meat, you need, but... meat. Meatspin.com as well. Often go there. Yeah. For... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't. People do not <laughs> go Toys there. We'll always check Toys R Gus. <laughs> I'm definitely going to go and check Toys R Gus Meatspin out. <laughs> Forward slash CompuServe. I've, I've, I've literally just found out when that was. It was 1999. He got the cease and desist. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Now, because we don't don't want to end on a sour note, let's reminisce for a second and get everyone's favourite Toys R Us experiences. And then, what we'll do the kind of our favourite night, the kind of our favourite true exclusive stuff as well. Right. So um, I went to uh, when I got married back in 2011. Uh, from my honeymoon, myself, and my wife, we went to uh, New York, uh, and we had stayed we stayed in a hotel, the Roosevelt, up uh, in off Lexington Avenue. Fancy. And of course, the first day. Yeah, fancy. Uh, the first day after I, uh, first day after we arrived, obviously after getting over the jet lag, I'm like, I'm off to Times Square, and my wife is like, Yeah, sure, I want to go to toy, I want to go to Times Square, and of course the reason I was going to Times Square was Toys R Us. Yeah. So I ended up going in there, and this is about the time where Pursuit of Cobra was on the shelves in there. Oh, so, uh, beauty. And, and um, some of the Transformers Revenge of the Fallen line, I think the tail end of that was coming out. Uh, and I ended up buying um, the movie version of Bludgeon, the tank. Yeah. Uh, Generations of Wheeljack and a bunch of the Pursuit of Cobra figures. Nice. Uh, now I, un- I only had a uh, I only had a small backpack with me because I wasn't <laughs> expecting to find anything there because it's Toys R Us. But I found all this stuff, and of course none of it was available in Ireland. So I'm like, okay, I'm buying all of it. And I ended up because my backpack was quite small. I took everything out of the package. And, and stuck it in the backpack. So I had, you know, two or three G.I. Joe figures and a few Transformers in my in my backpack. So you instantly lost Low Light's bullet, instantly, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I actually didn't find, it was it was uh, Dusty uh, Dusty and Duke, I think, were the two oh, I got okay. there. Fair enough. Uh, the, the, the rocket launcher backpack Duke. Um, so anyway, we went down to, our second stop on our honeymoon was obviously the Empire State Building. Because, you know, I've got priorities, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, first stop Toys R Us second stop sightseeing and, uh, so I go through into the Empire State Building they have you know security check you put your bag through an x-ray machine whatever I put my bag in through the x-ray machine and the security guard goes hey, because she sees a gun in my backpack <laughs> a very tiny so, gun surely she, she screams there's a gun in this backpack Surrounded within seconds by four or five security guys who are screaming at me. Wow. To get on the floor. Wow. And, uh, what the hell are you doing? What are you trying to bring in here? Blah, 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 you terrorist. And I'm <laughs> literally having like thing myself thinking, oh God, I'm going to die. This is it. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And, and I started, I started shouting. Um, it's fine. It's not. Re- it's not. Yeah. It's not. It's. <laughs> I start screaming, it's not a gun, it's not a gun, it's not a gun, it's a toy, it's a toy, it was just a Toys R Us. Amazing. And uh, they make me take the bag out of the x-ray machine and take out the the toys, obviously. And the security guards have me, they haven't got guns drawn to me or anything, but you know, it's a threatening situation. Guns are definitely on the table. Yeah, they're they're holding Uh, them, yeah. (laughs) They're getting ready, like. And uh, I open up the bag and I pull out and the, pull out the toys and... What set your woman off was Generations Wheeljack's gun slash wrench that you clipped onto his shoulder. You are kidding she saw me. That on the X- she saw that on the x-ray and she thought that was a gun. Wow. They thought that you had a bag full of tiny, bear- <laughs> tiny terrorists. little guns. <laughs> and all the- you were going to open the bag and these like fairy terrorists. Tiny- Brian-, Brian wasn't with you though, was he? The warm out of your bag. <laughs> Oh my god, that is amazing. Can I, uh, um, I don't know if this is a, a good story to tell Go about for Toys it. Us, but uh, when I worked there, I uh, multiple times had had sex in the <laughs> stock room and uh, store <laughs> box. So, I mean, I was in college, that's just what you do. Huh. That's amazing. <laughs> was, was there another person involved? <laughs> I wonder what it kept slipping on around the back of there. <laughs> Is this the part where we all throw in our personal anecdotes? Oh, sure. my, go for it, yeah. So the, uh, unfortunately, mine's not as exciting as either of those, but the uh, the store in Times Square, right out, right out of uh, college, I was working for a company uh, called Creative Arts Unlimited, and they, they designed large, like, uh, installation pieces for, like, stores and museums, and 
the very first job I got there was we built the entire Willy Wonka candy factory for the Toys R Us in Times Square. And so a lot of that stuff was actually hand painted and assembled by me. And so that was Ooh. always a real point of pride was to know that the window display in the Manhattan Toys R Us was uh, my doing. And now it's gone. <laughs> it's been obliterated. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's... well, it reopened recently. It's not, the, it's not as big and it's not the same, but... It doesn't have a giant friggin' Ferris wheel in the middle of it anymore, does it? No. Mm. That was I a lot of fun. I picked myself and uh, my daughter on that Ferris wheel, actually. Aww. I always got the dog, no matter what. Like not because of, of choice. Like I, you, we just that would be the the per, the timing each time. Like, and I did it probably about three or four times that Ferris wheel. It was fun. Yeah, Dave, do you have one for Toys R Us? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't. Well, well, <laughs> there's no, there's absolutely nothing I could possibly come out with that kind of like is, there or... yeah, or get like accosted for like terrorism or anything like. That. I mean, what, what, what's the point? Yeah, you're you right. Know? If you can't top those, what's the point? You're right. <laughs> I went in you there, I there and bought a Transformer. I, yeah. I could have said, oh, I, I remember a time a key peed in the aisle or something like that. <laughs> okay, and you well, would I've have got like one. laughed. And I've then got we could have you. worked it up to the, like, these great points. But, like, not going the other way around. It does, doesn't right. quite hold well, the I'll, same. I'll finish, I'll finish on, on one then. I used to work at Toys R Us. Oh, no, I, have a, I have another one, Chris. I have another, I have another one that's almost as exciting. Um, so... Uh, 10, 15, 10, 12 years ago, and uh, myself and my brother used to travel over to Manchester quite a bit uh, to go to concerts and nightclubs and so on because we were really into our dance music. And uh, one night, Ireland, Ireland, So uh, we went over to Manchester to go see uh, the Chemical Brothers were doing a DJ set in a nightclub that was going to be 12 hours long. So it it started on at 6 p.m. on a Friday. It was going to continue to 6 a.m. on the Saturday. Jesus. Uh, It was like the 20th anniversary of this nightclub that they had started DJing in and they were in college or something. So so they came along for that. Um, And uh, we we traveled over to Manchester on the Friday morning and I went to the Toys R Us in Ancuts in uh, the Ancuts area in Manchester. Yeah. And I got a a masterpiece Optimus Prime, the the original kind of early 2000s version, because, again, he wasn't available in Ireland. Um, So I picked that up, but I didn't have any luggage with me because we were literally traveling over to go to the concert, uh, traveling over on the Friday morning (laughs) flight, (laughs) staying up all night, and then flying back on the first flight in the morning. (laughs) Tell me you took Prime in with you. my God. So... I I brought Masterpiece Optimus Prime to this nightclub for a 12 hour long Chemical Brothers gig and th- this isn't the best bit this isn't the best bit right I had him under my arm for the entire night this isn't the, the best part is is at the end of the night because you know it was 6am in the morning and, and there wasn't that many people left over by the end of it um, we all got to go backstage and have drinks with the Chemical Brothers so I had <laughs> I ended up having drinks with the Character Brothers and meeting them for the first time in person with Op- Masterpiece Optimus Prime under my arm that I had just purchased in Toys R Us. Hey boy. Hey girl. <laughs> Superstar. Oh, hi Prime. That's amazing. <laughs> That is amazing. I can't believe you took him in there the entire time and met the Chemical Brothers with him as well. That is. You should have been Soundwave <laughs> or Blaster. That would have been even cooler. If only it was it was he was the only one out at the time. That's so. amazing, man. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, my one. You want actually... me to give a bonus story that you can cut out if I've already told it before? No, go for it. <laughs> okay. I'm just trying to keep you from getting yours in. I'm just gonna, we're just all going to keep cutting you off with more stories. <laughs> well, actually, mine is pointless now. It's not even that great. It's shit. it's literally about shit, but carry on. Oh. So um, it it had always been a, a a sort of dream of mine to own some kind of like large scale display item from Toys R Us as like a, a crown piece of my collection. And in January first, twenty sixteen, I went to a flea market with my sister, and we're walking around, and I see this booth there, and it's this older woman, and she's selling like literal garbage, like like cr- crappy like eighties watercolor <laughs> prints and like gold shiny frames for like ten dollars no one will ever buy clocks Actual like sh- yeah like, cameo like garbage stuff. And in the back of the the back of the booth on the wall is this enormous like 
probably seven foot long blue uh, sign that says "Welcome Friends" with Jeffrey's head on it, the the uh, eighty eight style Jeffrey head. Yeah. And so, of course, you know, my jaw hits the floor. And so I'm trying to keep my composure because I don't want to seem like I'm overly excited. And I say to this woman, oh, how much do you want for that sign of the giraffe? I'm not even calling it by its name. And she says, oh, I I, I can't sell him. He's my friend. I mean, this is like a very weird like flea market, you know. And I'm like, oh, well, you sure, though? Like, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd make you a good offer. And she's like, oh, I just I just couldn't. And I'm like, uh, all right, well. You gonna be here next week? She's like, yeah. I was like, well, I will too. And the week after that, and the week after that, until you sell it to me, right? <laughs> My desperation starting to really Stalk, seep through at this stalker. point. Stalker, yeah. <laughs> we wander around the flea market a couple more times, and I can't shut up about it. And I finally go back there, and she sees me again, and she says, "Oh, you're back." I was like, "Yeah." You, you decide you want to sell it yet? And she's like, "Oh, I don't know. I just I couldn't." And I'm like, "Yeah, you could." And she goes, <laughs> "Well, I mean, I I yeah I I I could, but it would it would just be for a crazy offer." And I was like, "Well, throw it at me." And I'm thinking in my head, "I'm going to start the yeah, offer around like three hundred dollars, right? Something crazy." She goes, "I I couldn't let it go for any less than like seventy five dollars." And I'm like, seventy five dollars? Hold on, be right back." So I run to the ATM, right? So I I buy the sign, and I'm you know I'm like uh you know the the, the BGs uh you know struts playing, and I'm walking to my car, you know I'm, I've got the head, my sister's got the end of the sign, and you know I'm more like high five. Isn't that? that one, yeah. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm I'm so pumped, right? Like it doesn't even fit in my car. It's like half hanging out the trunk. And, right? This is like the Jeffrey's, greatest day ever. Jeffrey's head sticking out the sunroof. That'd be yeah, like I'll never, I'll never forget. 2016 was popping lit the first day, right? <laughs> so we're driving away, and then it dawns on me, I'm like, hey, you know, there's a there's a Toys R Us, like like only a couple of minutes from this flea market. And I was like, we should go like take pictures in the parking lot, holding up the sign or whatever, like you know, like a big trophy <laughs> kill, right? No, I'm I'm purposely gonna not divulge the location of where this took place. Um, so <laughs> we so we get in the parking lot and you know we're holding it up, we're taking pictures with it, and you know Jeffrey selfies and all this stuff, right? And then I'm like, oh, let's go, uh, let's go check out Toys R Us since we're here. So we you know we shove it back in the car, all awkward, right? We walk in the Toys R Us, and above the entrance, there's two strings dangling there, and over the exit, there's the the mirror of this sign that no. says like you know see you later, like the other one, and I'm like, <gasps> right. And so the, the next time I went back to the flea market, that lady was there. And I was like, oh, where where'd you get that sign? I was just curious. And she's like, oh, you know, I've had it for like a real long time. I got it from a friend, you know, and I'd rather not say. And I'm like, uh, so anyway, I, I might have a hot sign, but <laughs> don't worry. But I'm not there. It's not going to be in business anymore. So. That, that, yeah, exactly. Do you want me to wait until they've gone fully out before I post this episode? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool. Let, let it rip. That is amazing. Um, yeah, I'm really going to let the side down now with mine. Uh, so I worked at Toys R Us and that, uh, one of the many days that I, I kind of, I've started off in the bikes and kind of outdoor section and I moved up to the electronics and away cause bikes was hideous. Uh, anyway, one day I had to cover the bikes again and I was kind of like, you know, a little bit like oh, resentful about it. I didn't want to have to do it. Um, but I stepped in, did it anyway and it was shit. Uh, literally because um a few moments into me kind of filling in that day i hear oh peter what have you done and i w- <laughs> literally that's i remember it to this day the name the voice everything it's in my head and uh, and i walk literally round the corner down that aisle where the electronic like jeeps and stuff were and there's this kid standing up in the jeep with these little cargo shorts on. He must have been about, I don't know. He was he was too old to be doing what he was doing, which I'll explain in a second. But far too, you know, but you know, young enough to fit in that Jeep. And the mom had picked him up and shit was just falling out of his shorts. <laughs> and it was and I was just like, "Oh, for f**k's sake." And then instead of just like just leaving him there to kind of consolidate all of the shit into one contained zone, she decides to pick him up and run to the, well, walk to the toilet, dropping <laughs> nodules all the way, which I'm talking like you had to go through the action, you had to zigzag through the action figure aisle in the corner of the store to get to it. Like this was in the middle of the store. So there's this <laughs> trail that she's been treading in as she's been walking this kid in front of her, genius, to um, to the toilet. And, and I was like, oh, for f- say and then obviously i had you know i had to get this bag which was like this kind of hazardous materials bag scoop the into it and everything go all around the store cleaning the 
desk off the floor. And then when I went into the toilet, she'd gone into the 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 you know the the kids kind of <laughs> care toilet, the special like disabled toilet thing, uh, with like the kids dressing table or whatever it is, you know the, the nappy table. And I go the in nappy there. Changing table, thank yeah. you. And I go in that. I, I walk in, and I'm, I'm not kidding you. It was like. It was like a scene from Saw. I don't know what she'd done in there. Like, I don't know why she thought it was a good idea to grab him by the armpits and spin round until all the shit was everywhere. But that's exactly what had happened. How else are you going to clean a kid off? Oh, yeah, well, the, yeah, she's like spinning it round, getting all the shit away, uh, and then just left. That's how she cleans things. And I walked in there, I was just like, what the f- is this? Like, And it was like smeared on stuff. Like she'd, like she'd had, like she'd been off that she'd had to do it so she took it out on us at Toys R Us to f***ing like you know by, by dirty protesting everywhere but anyway that was um, that was one of my favourite stories from Toys R Us and uh, well, let's not end on a sour note guys uh, let's start with Eric our favourite uh, Toys R Us exclusives um, well first off Toys R Us has been a great exclusive outlet for the uh, Joe fandom forever it's been like, the only it, outlet it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, essentially for the past couple of years, yeah. So, you know, there's there, I was actually scouring Yojo, looking at <laughs> yeah. uh, all these different, you know, trying to find all the different uh, Toys R Us exclusives and stuff. But, you know, I, I came to, I know it's not one of, it's not one of the best items. There there are certainly better figures and stuff. And it's not, a, it's not one of the fan favorites. But I have a real soft spot in my heart for the Stars and Stripes box set. Oh, no way! Uh, I thought you were joking when you sent me that no, picture. No, <laughs> I was not. I really do that. Ni- ninety-seven, I ninety-seven through ninety-eight yeah. are such such important years for GI Joe because you know at Hasbro they had to prove that GI Joe they wanted to bring GI Joe back, but they had to prove it was viable. So they went to Toys R Us and and did this exclusive line. It sold so well, despite the figures that you know the team that put them together. They were all newbies in the toy industry. They did not know what they were doing. They didn't know what molds they had left. <laughs> so that's why like, yeah, a lot that's of the that's all over the, the shop. Yeah, the, the, a lot of the figures that are on the packaging, a lot of the figures that were shown at Toy Fair and stuff, are not what was actually released because they had no idea what still existed and what didn't. Yeah. So they they did the best they could. So, and you can kind of see that whole fly by the seat of their pants thing. The Stars and Stripes box set, 1982 is my favorite year for G.I. Joe. So, like, those characters are my favorite characters and stuff like that. So, they, you know, to see them in these new decos with these, uh, you know, was really exciting. I love the sculpt of the the base, uh, despite the fact that yeah. it's painted terrible. The uh, <laughs> sculpt is really cool. Yeah. I actually have a repainted one. Yeah, I was going to say. I'm oh. sure. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've seen that. Don't they? Isn't yeah, it, it, like they they almost painted the detail completely off it, didn't they? Oh yeah, the... you can't even see. And there's so much nice detail. There's like grass and tree stumps and sandbags and all this yeah. stuff. So I love the whole idea of it. I wish it was better and stuff. But I like honestly that ninety ninety seven and ninety eight. If those two years hadn't happened, because that then there's a year break. But then in nineteen nine in uh nineteen in two thousand it comes back with the the two packs mm. in the blue orange packaging yeah and uh, that led into the whole GI Joe versus Cobra Venom versus Valor yeah, Spy yeah, yeah. era if it wasn't for them pushing that ninety seven and ninety eight product on Toys R Us I don't know when GI Joe would have came back and so so that ninety seven is actually much more important to the to the brand and people realize and yeah that set specifically like it, i would love to see a better like that's kind of what i wished the club had done for the final con yeah yeah um was like an update of that like in a in a better version or i mean even if they'd gone back to o-ring figures for it it would have been really nice like i mean that's almost kind of what what tanks for the memory was but they they could have done you know, like it's such a gr- it's such a great concept to have the original thirteen, mm. the kind of Iwo, G- Iwo Jima Jima ish flag yeah, base yeah. and stuff is such a good idea. And and so yeah. Also, that's probably my favorite. Uh, that's my favorite stalker deco on the original mold. Yeah. But like I love like he's one of the good figures in the set with like the really nice tiger stripe camo. And there you go. Cool, Adam. So I think Toys R Us kind of had three big phases of uh, exclusive retail for G.I. Joe. And 
I'm going to kind of cheat and just give you my favorites for all of them because oh, they're all so distinctly <laughs> different style-wise. Um, so from the 97, 98, 15th anniversary line, uh, I think that line provided a lot of collectors their very first opportunity to get some characters that hadn't been in production for a really long time, like Baroness and Lady J. Uh, but my personal favorite from that set's probably the Culber Rage with Alley Viper. Nice, nice. From the 2005, 2006 direct-to-consumer stuff, um, lots of good stuff in there, but I think my two favorites are Monkey Wrench and Major Blood. Um, in fact, that Blood really still holds up pretty well with a lot of the 25th stuff even yep and um from our most recent uh, retail offerings the 50th line and a uh, shout out to friends of the show daryl the priest and mark weber what, what? uh there were there were plenty of gems in that line but i'd say uh, the most notable for me are heat viper ice viper and gung-ho nice what about paddy uh, i got a few as well um i don't really never really got the vintage stuff but um in terms of the modern era, my two favorites are the 2010 Toys R Us exclusives, which was uh, Quick Kick and Ooh, uh, yeah. Spirit Iron Knight. You don't uh, have so to that's the, me, Daddy. <laughs> I, I know you worked on those two, Eric, but uh, I, I actually I actually do think they are fantastic figures. I hate uh, they them. I think they're, shit. they're the worst figures ever. <laughs> I mean, they were better at Ross, but they were okay at Toys R Us. <laughs> Yeah, they're better as Ross exclusives. All GI Joe stuff is better as Ross exclusives. Well, yeah, I think uh, I, 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 I love the homages in them. Obviously, um, not even just like uh, obviously, Spirit Iron Knife is Billy from Predator, but um, the the Quick Kick has some homages where he's kind of uh, he's got the Kung Fu Fist uh, logo tampoed on him. Yeah, yeah, and he's got and he's of course is wearing the opposite color of from Bruce Lee from Game of Death. Which the, with, uh, uh, the black, uh, black with the yellow stripe rather the than yellow with black stripes. Of, uh, the, the, the color scheme on Quick Kick is also the uh, Karate the, Kid. The Karate Kid outfit of Johnny the. Johnny uh, Lawrence, is that who it is? Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 but, you know, yeah. but hypothetically, it, it might vaguely resemble that, but any, any resemblance to characters living or dead is purely coincidental. <laughs> 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 and um, the <laughs> other one I really like uh, is the 50th Destro. Um, oh, yeah, nice. The, the slightly you know, the, the update of him with the angler head on him. Uh, I think that's a great figure. Uh, and, of course, it was released to Toys R Us as well. So that's it. That's my, my picks. Fantastic. Dave? A little bit different for me, uh, being somewhere where none of the sort of G.I. Joe exclusives have been sold in the UK. But if I was to pick one uh it would be one that adam touched on which is gung-ho uh being packed in with like the shadow uh crimson guard or the shadow guard or whatever it was called yeah, yeah. but just to be able to get like that long awaited gung-ho update was just an absolute belter and then to get gaucho from that too that's pretty amazing yep. wasn't it yeah was that where you go well, of course <laughs> well i mean you, you can't gung-ho was clearly modeled on the original gaucho so it, <laughs> yeah. it made sense that that was you know you, you don't peak like we did with the store toys r us stories with the best one first you kind of build up to it don't you so uh, i'll bring it down again know, don't worry yeah that, that, that that's that's my my thinking awesome um, for me, it has to be the Night Force, um, and I'll go specifics, but obviously back in like 88, 89, um, there were two, <clears throat> well, there were lots of different, like two packs for the figures, vehicles, of course, but um, it was a Toys, R- a Toys R Us exclusive range, like a, a, like the sub-team was, a, was an exclusive to Toys R Us, so that, uh, that's something, again, we didn't see in the UK, but when I found out these things existed and saw them for the first time with my own eyes nearly did, did three shits all at once. Like, I was just like, oh, my God. You so were just it, like Paul and his power sp- wheels. <laughs> Split <shits. laughs> I was speed king. I was shitting everywhere. I did, well, probably vomited at the same time. So you it like, was like... You were was... like a machine at a cupcake factory. <laughs> <laughs> so I was... You lit- were shaking like a dog. I was. And it, it was amazing. Like, I just... The, the decos on some of these guys. Like, I love how they did Spearhead. Um, you know, the kind of the teal in there as well. And... But for, for me, like, it was probably... It's a toss-up between uh, the Repeater Char Brawl uh, two-pack. But only because the Repeater is just so awesome. And it kind of, like, tones down Char Brawl's kind of design a little bit too. But also the Outback one as well. Like, just that that set was just amazing. So... 
I have to go, yeah, with with Night Force on this one, and I mean some of those vehicles as well were just amazing. Um, but yeah, out back in Crazy Legs two pack and um, Repeater and Charbroil, big fans of those. Um, okay. So, wait, wait, were you seriously not going to mention the Action Man Night Force figure from two thousand four? Yes, we're seriously not going to mention that. Um, oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's men- uh, the, well, you've uh, mentioned it, so it's out there. Um, I do actually like that figure and was kind of hoping for it to be the 13th after someone mentioned it could it fit the kind of, you know, the criteria for the, the club's clues in the last FSS 13th figure. So well, we'll be finding out pretty soon, I should imagine. Um, but then again, the, the, the deliveries of those are so far apart at the moment. But anywho, um, so that's it for this instalment of the Full Force News Burst. Thank you to my awesome co-hosts, Eric, Adam, Paddy and Dave. See you next time. And as always, Full Force. Make sure you get involved with the discussion by liking, sharing and commenting on these videos. And as always, you can keep up with the show after listening by following on Twitter at The Full Force, liking the Facebook page, facebook.com slash The Full Force. And if you would like to contact the show, you can message us on either of these platforms with feedback, questions or to say, who do you think you are? A serious operation now? No, not even close. Look out for more of these news bursts that we are posting on the Facebook page from now on. Full Force.